I think it's one o'clock. So we can get started. We have 46 of us on the line. I'm sure others will be joining us. Um, I ask that you please mute yourself unless uh, we're having a conversation. Uh, and I want to welcome you all. I'm Marcy Winograd, and I am the coordinator, uh, volunteer with Code Pink Congress. Very proud to work with this terrific team. And I wanted to introduce our other co-hosts or have our other co-hosts introduce themselves. So Hania, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Marcy. Um, my name is Hania Jodat uh, Barnes and I am the president co-founder of Muslim Delegates and Allies. And it's always an honor to be here, especially tonight with uh, in discussing such a critical um, country, one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world. Um, so thank you to all of our allies for being here and uh, our guests, uh, honorable speakers who will be joining us and sharing their wisdom with us shortly. But um, uh, Marcy, are we waiting for Medea? Um, no, I, I'm just wondering about um, Nadia, is she joining us? She will be joining us shortly. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll have her. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, we, um, while we wait for, I can perhaps go through the agenda if we could share the agenda in the chat um, while we still are admitting people. Yeah, so uh, the agenda, we're gonna do some updates and then we'll get into our guests' presentations, Dr. Aisha Juman and Hassan El Taib. We'll have a question and answer period and we'll, we will then follow that up with a capital calling party. I uh, wanted to share my impressions of the hearings. We had a lot of hearings today. Um, I don't know how many were able to catch some of them. Uh, I saw probably an hour and a half of the Haynes hearing this morning. Mm -hmm. And some of the takeaways that I left with were that it, this is a tough, tough Senate. Uh, Mark Warner, the Democratic uh, Senator from Virginia who will soon be chairing the committee uh, was very anti-China. You know, we have to be competitive. The Republicans were all alarmed about China, Iran, Venezuela. And uh, I kept thinking, boy, they are, they are to the right of Biden and this is, a t this is gonna be tough. Uh, still, there were some good questions asked. There, there was not the kind of follow-up questioning that I would have liked to have seen, but there were some questions asked. Uh, Cornyn asked her about her work with Palantir, which is the data mining company no, excuse me. He asked her about her uh, work with West Exec, which is the lobbying, well, they call themselves strategic advisors. Blinken and Flournoy and Haynes all were on the payroll there. That it, whether she was a principal or was she a consultant, if she were a principal, which is what she was listed as, then she would know their client list. And she said she was not a principal. Technically, she just worked for them once a month and didn't know much. Um, they asked her, had you ever worked for a any company on the uh, banned list, or what do we, you know, that that was involved with the China Chinese military industrial complex? She said no. She had done some advising for a private French company. Uh, Heinrich, the senator from New Mexico, asked her if she would agree with the conclusion of the committee that torture had been ineffective, and she skirted that and said she understood it was unlawful and that there were better techniques. Hmm. She did not say she agreed with that conclusion, which I thought was of concern. Uh, <clears throat> there was a question put to her about whistleblowers. Would you agree to share with the committee complaints filed by, for example, CIA whistleblowers? And she said she would agree to share credible complaints. Kind of was wondering about that. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Very hawkish committee overall, I thought. Uh, Ron Wyden asked her some questions about uh, <clears throat> the, the hacking of CIA computers uh, during the Senate torture investigation when the CIA agents hacked the computers and breached the firewall between the executive and the legislative branch. Are you Marcy? Marcy? Are you yeah. Marcy? 
Uh, there, yeah. I'm getting, and you're reading a lot of chats. People are all asking you to turn up your volume, if you would, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know why this volume is low. Okay, I'm going to speak louder. Is that better? Much. <laughs> Much better. Okay. Speak loud. So, uh, <clears throat> she was asked if she agreed that, well, she was asked for a response. It was open-ended to uh, the hacking of the Senate computers uh, during the torture investigation. And she said she agreed with uh, Brennan, who I guess was the CIA director at the time, she agreed with his apology. There was no, there was never, I, I didn't see a question put to her point blank. Why did you overrule the inspector general and fail to discipline these hackers? Why did you redact the uh, re report from 6,000 pages to 500? I, I never heard those questions. I, I didn't listen to the whole hearing. I had to go to work, but uh, I didn't hear that. So that was my takeaway. Uh, we have a very hawkish Senate Intelligence Committee. And so it will be our role to, to challenge their hawkishness. That's, that's what I came away with. Anyone else wanna share impressions of the committee hearings? Just so everyone is aware, we do have about 86 participants on the call. If you could use the raise your hand uh, button, uh, that would be great if you have any questions. Oh, one, or like to share. one other thing that she said during the hearings, Haynes, uh, <clears throat> Ron Wyden asked if she would share the CIA report on the Khashoggi murder, their conclusion, uh, would, she, would she share it? And she said she would. And he seemed elated at that. He said he'd been trying to get it from the Trump administration and had been stonewalled. <clears throat> but I didn't hear anyone ask if she would share the original 6,000 page torture report. I do see two hands up here. I do see Omer Abid and I also see uh, James Carpenter's hands. If you could uh, keep your comments to perhaps maybe less than 30 seconds, that would be great. Yeah, this is James Carpenter. Just want to know when will the hearings be concluded and does it have to be confirmed by the full Senate? So when should we stop when should we stop complaining about this nomination? I think we should continue until she is absolutely confirmed. I read in the um, online that they didn't think she would be confirmed tomorrow. Uh, it's clear she will be she will be approved by this committee. They made that very clear at the outset. And I uh, to anticipate she will be approved by the full Senate, but I think we should continue until until she is. And I think even though uh, they intend to confirm her, that it's important that we raise these issues so they are always in the background. I was able to use some of the interview that we did with uh, John Kiriakou on Haynes, and I uh, tweeted that, and it's gotten about 10,000 views and was included in a report from Al Jazeera mm -hmm. on the hearings. So it's out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Omer, if you can uh, unmute yourself, please. Oh yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, it would be it, just something to put in our back of our, our minds that it would be good to put pressure on um, the, uh, um, Congress uh, to release that 5,000 page report uh, because, uh, uh, I, I, you know, uh, obviously it would be great if the CIA, um, uh, if they release it, but I, I, I doubt they will re release it. So it'd be nice if we just put in the uh, back of our minds, you know, mm -hmm. while there's a democratic administration to try to, to, try to, uh, to do that. I remember that uh, uh, there was something about that report, um, like, 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 just like hardly any, like, I don't know, just like, like, like a couple places or like one place has it. Uh, and uh, like the, uh, I remember Senator, uh, Senator Feinstein, you know, she, she had it. And then uh, I, I think I remember something about it. It's something about Obama's uh, library or something, uh, well, but I don't, yeah. Um Omar, as far as I know, that report has not been released, not even to the committee, as far as I know. Oh, you know, okay. And redacted, it was a, I think it was a 6,000 page report conducted over a five year period. And it was uh, instead redacted so that it was just a summary. Mm. So I, you know, it was a 500 page summary that was released. And that 
is available online. And if you email me, Marcy at codepink.org, I'll be glad to send you that link. Well, Marcy, it does look like we do have uh, Sister Nadia here also on the call, who is also the co-founder and chairwoman of the uh, advisory board of Muslim Delegates and Allies. Sister Nadia, if you could please unmute yourself and say a few words, and then perhaps we could um, introduce our honorable guest. Well, thank you um, so much for everybody for joining us today with uh, Code Pink. I wanted to, um, to thank you on behalf of Muslim Delegates and Allies Coalition. I also wanted to, um, to thank the American Muslim Democratic Caucus um, and other uh, partner organizations for uh, providing constant support uh, for these efforts. I think it's really important um, that we really uh, spread word of these events. Um, and so in the future, I'd really appreciate if you can bring at least three or four more people um, to this because this movement is really fueled by, by people and the people power that we have is what gives us the power. Absolutely, thank you. And I was just talking to a friend about this last night. Um, you know, by and large, our uh, population is not paying close attention to foreign policy, to legislation to demilitarize. So our voices can be that much more amplified because we are really filling in a void here. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what a better um, you know, topic to really lead to our um, conversation with uh, Dr. Joman, who's, it's an absolute honor to be here in your, in your presence. And I will hand this over to Nadia for the, for the quick introduction. Um, so Nadia, please take it away. Okay, thank you um, so much, Hania. Um, so first I wanted to, um, to mention as well that just recently, um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had designated that um, that the Houthis um, as a foreign uh, terror group and a move that the United Nations uh, says is going to block aid and other um, and other um, aid and relief um, to help against the famine on a scale that has not been seen for over 40 years. Um, Yemenis are crowding into markets and shops to stockpile whatever they can afford. Uh, and families are very terrified that there is no food or other supplies available. Um, and so we're going to have um, a, a question and answer session. Um, and we're also gonna host our Capitol Hill calling party to urge our representatives uh, to support the removal of Trump's designation um, of, of this group in Yemen as terrorists and to restore um, US aid um, to, to Yemen. Um, and so first I would like to introduce um, Dr. Aisha Juman, who is a Yemeni American epidemiologist and the president of the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. It's really an honor to introduce her. Dr. Juman has over 30 years of experience in public health, including viral vaccine preventable diseases, cervical and breast cancer research surveillance, maternal child health and nutrition, primary health care and women in development. Um, and with first-hand knowledge of conditions on the ground, she's going to talk about the dire consequences of the U.S. support for the Saudi UAE assault on Yemen. Dr. Jaman. Uh, honored to be here, and thank you very much to be, uh, for the invitation uh, to speak about Yemen, uh, because as Marcy said, uh, unfortunately, people who have a lot of money and power have been uh, siding with the Saudi on the aggression on the Yemeni people. So I'll talk a little bit about the humanitarian aspect of the war on Yemen. Uh, but before that, I always like to start uh, talking about Yemen in a different way. Um, I, I like to talk about Sana'a city. Sana'a is the oldest conti continuously inhabited city in the world. It's a UNESCO heritage site. It's one of the most beautiful places uh, anybody can visit. So I want you to think of Yemen uh, also in terms of culture, history, and beauty. So um, going from there, I'll start talking about uh, the humanitarian crisis. All my resources are from the UN and from the US and UK sources. And the reason for that is I want to be as objective as possible because this is something that is very close to my heart I have family in Yemen. And so it's very challenging for me to talk about this uh, as an objective uh, person, because I know of people who've been killed, maimed, uh, and died due to um, the aggression on, on Yemen. 
So based on UN reports, there are 24 million of the 30 people, million people who live in Yemen are in need of some assistance. Of these, 14 million people need assistance now. There are about 4 million people in Yemen who are internally displaced. A lot of the media attention that comes about wars comes from uh, people who are displaced or refugees. Because Yemen is under a blockade and all points of entry into Yemen are controlled by the Saudis and the UAE, Yemenis have no, no way of getting out of Yemen. So the displaced people, 4 million of them are in Yemen. Also, uh, because of the blockade and the destruction of the food sources, every food source in Yemen had been targeted by the Saudi airstrikes. Yemen is facing the largest humanitarian crisis in terms of food insecurity. There are 16.2 million people in Yemen who are at an emergency or higher level or food insecurity. And that is basically all of Yemen, except one state in Yemen that is uh, Hadramaut, where it is at the stress level. Basically what that means, a lot of these people, if they don't get 25% who are in the emergency stage, if they don't get immediate assistance, they're gonna die from hunger. So if we look at also of what, you know, the destruction of health services, 50% of Yemeni health services and health centers had been destroyed. In addition to that, there are also um, diversion of fuel that gets into Yemen, into a Jeddah port. And some of the fuel ships stay there up to 256 days. And then Yemenis have to pay fines for holding these ships because they're not able to do business. So because of that, and the, again, the destruction of health services, destruction of water services, destruction of electricity. We've also had a range of other infectious diseases that are spreading in Yemen. We have waterborne diseases that are affecting most of the people in the central uh, lands of Yemen. And we also have vector-borne diseases like dengue, for example, and chikungunya and malaria that affect most of the coastal areas of Yemen. And if we put these two together, we realize that almost all of Yemen is impacted by this. So I'll give you examples of that cholera, uh, which we have over 2 million cases of cholera in Yemen. In the 21st century, it's actually a shame on us as human beings and as, on humanity that we have an outbreak at this level and this magnitude, and we're not able to control it. We, if we look at dengue fever as well, for example, this year in 2020, there were over 600,000 dengue fever cases in Yemen. This is horrific because Yemen has already all the four serial types of dengue fever, which means any new cases uh, are gonna be uh, more hem hemorrhagic in presentation and higher death is gonna happen because of that. If we look at uh, severe acute respiratory infections, we are in the same, uh, place as well where we have a large number of cases. Yemen has the largest fatality rate from COVID-19 at 30%. This uh, with a health system that has been uh, destroyed. Diphtheria, for example, that affects mostly children and is vaccine preventable. Uh, Yemen has not had a, a diphtheria outbreak since 1980. However, in 2018, we started seeing a diphtheria outbreak that has been raging until now, to, until 2020. So these are some of the issues that our, uh, the population is suffering from. However, the fear of hunger is the one that most people are concerned about. Uh, there was a survey that was done in Yemen about their concern about COVID-19. The respondents, told us in the survey that they are more concerned about increasing food prices and loss of income than they are about becoming sick with COVID-19. We were told through our, the people who distribute food aid to, Yem to Yemeni in need that from many families that they would rather die of COVID-19 than die of hunger because that is a more severe death. Um, in all of that, we also have seen, because of the blockade and the war, we've seen a huge depreciation of the Yemeni rial. 
compared to the US dollars. And of course, for any import into Yemen, you need the US dollars. And the situation with the depreci depreciation is actually worse in the areas under the Saudi Emirati controls and under the Sana'a government. For example, in December of 2020, the rate of exchange in the areas under the Saudi and Emirati was 840 per dollar compared to 600 in the Houthi controlled areas. If we look at the people, uh, there was also USAID cut aids in, uh, for Yemen. What concerns me when USAID cuts aid to Yemen is they also bully other countries into reducing aid to Yemen. And so there have been a huge cut in Yemen since uh, USAID decided to cut aid. And for example, from December, in December uh, 2019, there were 15.6 million people receiving aid from UN agencies. By April of 2020, only 9.5 million were receiving aid. If we look also at uh, the, in terms of programs, the UN had 41 programs in Yemen that they were supporting. Unfortunately, because of the aid cuts, that 31 of these programs were cut. Yesterday, I also heard uh, that uh, UN agencies that used to support health centers with fuel, that they also are going to be start cutting fuel to the health centers, which is a guaranteed way of shutting what is remaining of the functioning health, functioning health centers in Yemen, because fuel crisis is huge uh, in Yemen. Between June of last year to uh, the end of 2020, only about one to 2% of what Yemen needs in fuel got into Yemen. There were a lot of issues with the cuts. Also, there is a Washington Post article that said at Yemen hospital racked by US funding cuts, children are dying from hunger. Emergency relief coordinator reiterates that Yemen is being starved while the security council Councils echoes calls for action. So, and this is very important because a lot of the aid agencies in Yemen are very reluctant to speak up freely about the issues in Yemen. This is a man-made crisis. This is a political decision to stop the people of Yemen. This is not a natural disaster that we could not see or, for, or foresee. For example, in 2017, when Jan Eagleland from NRC visited Yemen, he came, and he came back and said, there is a biblical proportion of famine in Yemen. At that point in time, there were 7 million people who were uh, experiencing famine. And that's in 2017. By 2020, that number is 16.2 million. And of course, everybody has heard about the designation of Houthi by the outgoing uh, Trump administration. It went into effect today that will have also a huge impact on the Yemeni population in terms of reduced funding for the humanitarian response. It will halt the work of many international agencies. All the financial services, whether we're sending money for aid or sending money for families, those are gonna be affected because banks will refuse to transfer funds to Yemen. And I know from the Yemen relief work that we do, every time we send money to Yemen, we face a lot of challenges and multiple times they have returned the money because banks refuse to take it. So um, right now we only have one route and that is to transfer in euros through a bank in Germany. I'm not sure if we are going to be able to continue uh, to send money to Yemen for that. However, there were some licenses, so I'm grateful for those licenses, but that's not enough. We really need this to be reversed um, according to former diplomats who had worked in Yemen and the region, the Houthis do not meet the criteria for this designation. We also know that there, it's going to impact uh, an already very fragile population um, and in, you know, increase uh, hunger and, and death in Yemen and put uh, the majority of people at, at full-fledged famine. Uh, and, I've, and as you've heard, every agency that's working in Yemen uh, have come against this decision. I just want to read a few of them for, to you. Um, Refugee International called this reckless and destructive. 
uh, Mercy Corps called this deeply concerned about the harmful effect. NRC called this will, will hamstring the ability of aid agencies to respond. Counterproductive and dangerous Oxfam America and pure diplomatic vandalism rescue organization. So I'll stop here um, and I hope to answer questions that you may have. Thank you. Well, um, something to, to really quickly point out, uh, Dr. Aisha, based upon what you were saying, uh, according to UNICEF, uh, there's more than 24 billion people, which some 80% uh, make up some 80% of the population are now starving in this uh, crisis and 12 million of those are children. Um, and hospitals are starving for gloves, let alone oxygen, right, during coronavirus. So, uh, Marcy. Okay. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, doctor. We're now going to go to our other guest, uh, Hassan El Taib, who is the lobbyist with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And we're so proud and uh, honored to have both of you with us. And if you can uh, give us um, give us some background on this conflict, as well as what we can do going forward and the obstacles and, and the actions we can take. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all so much for, for joining and inviting Aisha and I. Uh, we're honored to be here and we love Code Pink. Uh, we, uh, I, when I first got to DC to lobby to end support for the Yemen war, I crashed on the Code, at, on the code Pink couch with Pocky for about four weeks. We watched Democracy Now! quite a bit. And uh, I would just, you know, go from the Code Pink house to, uh, to lobby every door in Congress that I could. And that was in 2018, uh, around the first Yemen war powers push. So, um, yeah, so let's talk. I mean, Yemen, like Aisha laid out, is in a really desperate situation. And um, we're at a real crossroads. The There's a lot of bad stuff, but there's some good stuff that, I, and I wanna kind of put it together and sort of figure out what we can do about it. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on the origins of the war, but kind of just move us along. So just so people have context, you know, it's, it's, Yemen has a very complex history and Aisha, you know, she can correct me if I'm wrong on anything. But, you know, the gist of it is in, in 2011, uh, there was an Arab Spring uprising that ousted uh, President Saleh in a nonviolent way. And uh, they installed Vice President Hadi to be the interim leader as they moved to a more representative form of government. There's a, you know, there's, there was tensions there, you know, there was a real feeling that, uh, you know, there was corruption and the needs weren't being met. And uh, the Houthis, you know, rose up and ousted um, uh, then President Hadi. Uh, with actually the ex-president Saleh and together um, they started, they captured Sana. Uh, Hadi fled to, to Riyadh and, and asked for support from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman. Then the defense minister put together the Saudi-led coalition to start a, a full-scale aerial campaign and blockade on, on the country of Yemen. In, in an effort to reinstall Hadi as the, you know, the, the primary government in the country. Uh, the, the Obama administration was negotiating the Iran nuclear deal at the time. They were feeling pretty vulnerable and they went ahead and supported the military um, uh, of Saudi Arabia and supported the Saudi led coalition uh, in the form of mid-air refueling, uh, air, you know, aerial support with logistics. They, they, they gave spare parts transfers, which are really important for these coalition airstrikes, uh, logistical support, targeting assistance. And with that support, uh, Saudi Arabia just started bombing civilians. I mean, that's pretty much what's been going on. Uh, you know, I think well over 50 percent of the casualties right now from these airstrikes are, in fact, you know, innocent Yemenis. Uh, and the blockade, uh, which Aisha mentioned, is just really choking off the ability of the country to import and export commercial goods. Uh, it's hurting their ability to import humanitarian assistance and 16 million people are living on the brink of famine. 
Now, we've seen Congress push back in, in a large part because of the work of groups like Code Pink and, um, you, you know, just really, you know, speaking truth to power and working on, you know, the grassroots lobbying effort. And, and together, we did something pretty powerful. We ended up passing for the first time in U.S. history a war powers resolution to cut off support for the Saudi-led coalition war in Yemen. And that was in 2019, uh, April 2019. Unfortunately, Trump vetoed that resolution, and um, but Congress forced more votes, and you know has done uh, an incredible uh, you know um, effort to try to push back on the Saudi-led coalition. In that time, we've seen a real uh, coalition form on the Hill that, that's made up of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we've got Biden to basically say that he wants to end support for the war. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. Now, here are the, the potential pitfalls. Um, in the lame duck, Trump ran through about $23 billion of weapon sales to the UAE. There was a vote to block that. It didn't get the amount of votes we needed. Almost every Democrat voted to block the, the weapons deal, except for two, uh, uh, Kelly and Cinema from from Arizona every single uh, Republican except for Rand Paul voted to to supply the UAE with these weapons also in the lame duck the Trump administration is trying to push another 800 million dollars of weapons to Saudi Arabia now there are I believe your your call campaign tonight I gave a script to Medea and Danica um, about these joint resolutions of disapproval uh, to block the, the Saudi weapon sales. I think that's a great ask um, of members right now to, to, to do that. I mean, we, we know that Biden's been saying the right thing. If anybody watched the, the nomination hearings of Blinken and Austin, I did because I'm kind of a nerd and I just sat in front of C-SPAN for a good chunk of my day. Um, and they were saying largely the right things on this on this issue, but we need to put a lot of pressure on them, especially on the UAE sales. Because while I've heard uh, I've heard Biden be good on um, on Saudi, the UAE piece, I haven't really heard them mention that. And there's going to be a strong effort and strong push to you know support the UAE because of the Abraham Accords. Uh, because they've normalized their relationship with Israel, so you know there's going to be a a reluctance to try to cut off the weapons because it was largely looked at that, you know, those were, you know, quid pro quo. We'd give them the weapons they would normalize. But uh, we can't let that happen. They're a huge driver of the violence in Yemen. They transfer these weapons to Al Qaeda affiliates. They're trying to annex parts of Yemen, and they've been a real obstruction of the peace process and, and working through 90,000 proxies in Yemen. So we can't forget about the damaging role the UAE has played. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, um, there, there's so many things to mention, but I don't want to overwhelm anybody. The FTO designation it happened on January 12th. Uh, Secretary Pompeo, one of his final moves, this uh, um, a disastrous decision to label the, the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization. And what that means is, you know, organizations like Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, Aisha's amazing org, and, and other organizations risk criminal liability if they do any transactions or communicate at all with the Houthis. And they control, you know, they're governing territory with 80% of the population. This is, you know, unprecedented that they would try to do an FTO designation on a population that's this big. Uh, they're the de facto government, not just, a, you know, a ragtag group. Um, so I, I think that's deeply problematic. Um, so the good thing is that members are speaking out the chairman Meeks from the House Armed Services Committee he took over for Engel after Engel got beat by Jamal Bowman. So now Democratic Representative uh, Rep Meeks, um, who is, you know, a little better, not as good as Castro on, on a lot of the issues, but, you know, is, is pretty good on some some issues, especially Iran. But he led a letter in the House calling for reversal of the FTO designation on, you know, early in the Biden administration. So that's positive. Uh, so that's good. We've had a few Republicans, including uh, Senator Young, who's issued a statement pushing back. Um, just so folks have it, I've been keeping track of everybody that has put out a statement. I'm just going to drop it in the chat. And if your member is not on there, they, they you should give them a call. 
another thing I'll drop in the chat is a letter that FCML um, and Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation uh, supported calling on Biden to reverse on day one, because I think that's critical. Now, you know, on top of cutting off humanitarian aid, the FTO designation will also prevent uh, peace talks from actually happening. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for a special envoy to Yemen, Martin Griffiths, to be able to conduct any sort of dialogue between, you know, the Hadi government, the STC, the Houthis, Saudi Arabia, all the different partners, uh, all the different warring parties right now. So I think that's really critical um, that we reverse this. Uh, Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security advisor, has said he wants to reverse, so that's a good sign. But they need to be hearing from us. This is this has to be like a, not day one, hour one, minute one, second one. We need to, you know, this could be a disaster for millions of Yemenis, and it could put tip Yemen into a famine, as Mark Lowcock has warned and Aisha has spoke to. So, uh, I think those are great action items. Last thing I'll mention is. Rokana is considering introducing another Yemen war powers resolution. Um, I don't know how I got the controls, but I've been admitting people to this talk. I, I, you know, I, I hope they're cool. <laughs> yeah, one of the co-hosts, Hassan, that's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm like, you know, let that guy in, let that guy in. You know, hopefully I'm not letting in like, you know. Uh, oh, everyone's a family here, so all, all are welcome. That, that's how I feel. Uh, <laughs> You know, unless uh, unless you're Secretary Pompeo, then you ain't you ain't part of my family. <laughs> Is that too soon? Okay, soon to be ex Secretary Pompeo. So, um, but yeah, Ro Khanna wants to introduce a Yemen War Powers resolution, um, uh, and he he's saying that he will uh, to cut off U.S. support for the Saudi led coalition war in Yemen. We've already passed another version. We're trying to do it again, and I think it's so critical that we do this because we got to figure out how to not get into future wars. And strengthening the Yemen War Powers Resolution of the War Powers Act in 1973 is going to give us the tool to end unauthorized wars in the future. And if we get Biden to sign, he'll be the first president in history to sign a, a, a WPR. And that is just so powerful, one for preventing future um you know, fours. And I also think it's going to help diplomacy on ending the Yemen war in particular, because it'll show the warring parties that it's not just Biden, but it's bipartisan, uh, bicameral majorities in Congress that want to end the war. And that's a lot more leverage than just one person doing it with executive order. And we also have the added benefit that in four years, Trump 2.0 can't take it away from us. You know, it'll be a signed law. So that is why it's so important that we get uh, get this through. With that, I'll open it up to any questions and happy to happy to chat more. Thank you so much. And before I forget, um, how can if both of you could put in the chat how people can reach you if they have further questions? I think, uh, Hania and Nadia are going to take the questions in the stack. Sure. Absolutely. Um, there was a there was a very important question that came up because it is nowadays it's very hard to really uh, trust organizations. Um, but uh, Pat asks, which charity organizations are the most trusted for Yemen help? If you could um, guide us, uh, Dr. Um, Jaman and, and Hassan, that would be wonderful. Can, can I speak on behalf of Aisha and her amazing work? Sure. <laughs> Aisha leads one of the best humanitarian organizations I've ever seen in action. They work with Yemenis on the ground in Yemen. Uh, they use Yemen, Yemen source products and goods. And it's uh, led by someone of incredible integrity and honesty and clear eyed vision, which is Aisha. Um, I think if anything we can do to support Aisha and her important work, is you know so huge and it and they go into parts of yemen that a lot of the other humanitarian orgs don't go to they go to the rural areas where uh, internally displaced yemenis are are found and and work to provide food baskets medical relief and i couldn't i can't say enough i think yemen yemenfoundation.org um you know kicking a few bucks i i know i've, I've kicked in a few bucks 
And uh, I'll let Aisha keep going, but I just wanted to speak on her behalf because it, it might be kind of awkward if she's trying to do that for herself. So, <laughs> it, I'm, I'm grateful for the support. Thank you. We we do uh, we're a volunteer organization both here and in Yemen, and we, as Hassan said, we work with people in the field. Uh, so, and we work in inaccessible areas. A lot of people don't realize that Yemen has the highest mountains in the Middle East. Uh, so what that means, we have a lot of scattered population that live in very difficult areas. And because we work with individuals in these areas, it's very easy for us to reach the neediest uh, because it doesn't cost us uh, travel to these areas. We also don't need uh, security because a lot of the international agencies need security to travel within Yemen. And we don't need uh, permits to be working in these areas because again, we're working with locals. Uh, they are all volunteers and we're also volunteers here. So we've been able to um, reach quite a lot of people with whatever we get, 100% of the donations go to support uh, people in need. Um, our next question, and thank you, Hassan, for, um, I'm, I'm so impressed, I have to say, Hassan, you spoke so eloquently for a, a couple of minutes. You admitted people to this, this, this Zoom call. That's a, you know, that's a talent. Uh, so it's thank you. And click and, you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge talent. I have important duty as a co-host of this <laughs> event, apparently. I, well, I don't know if you're going to miss out. This is, a, this is normally a female-led uh, event, but hey, Hassan, we will welcome you to be one of our co-hosts for the future, so. Um, now, um, Sister Nadia, I did post the other question for you. Um, if, you could, if you could ask it, that'd be great, from Mike Levy. The question we have from Mike uh, Levy is, can US agency or her US aid agency enact an uh, immediate effective carve out for humanitarian organizations to enable aid while we work to end the terrorist designation or might that work against us also? So that's the, the question. Aisha, would you like to, to take Go a first? Ahead. Go okay. ahead, I need to speak out. Yeah, so there, I, I there's reasons why that's problematic is because prior to the designations, commercial shippers uh, have already been reluctant to import to Yemen, given the high risk of delays uh, and risks of violence and the extra costs. So these designations only increase this level of risk for commercial entities and um, put uh, and further places uh, the vital work of humani humanitarian peace builders at risk. You know, even if these humanitarian exemptions are allowed, uh, these financial institutions, you know, are are likely to find the risk to be too high and, and resulting in them scaling down the humanitarian assistance. So I, I think we got to really push for, you know, reversing on day one and, you know, getting that over the finish line because it's just it's just too risky. Uh, there's just so much risk involved. And, and this is on top of a Saudi coalition blockade on Yemen on all ports of entry into the country. So it's it's like squeezed, you know, OJ that's been squeezed again. It's just like the, Yemen's just been squeezed so much. Um, and we've yeah. So I think just calling for that. What I what I see the administration might do is they might actually put a pause on the FTO designation and then just review internally and then work to reverse. So that's another potential option where you don't let it go through, you just hit the pause button. There's a bunch of different ideas, but we just have to keep being loud and keep getting members to speak out. And that's gonna raise the urgency for the administration. If your member is not on the list of folks that have spoken out yet, make sure that they are on that list and we're tracking it. And I want to add a little bit here. Uh, so today they also they had some uh, licenses for people like us to continue the work, but still that doesn't mean that we're not at risk of liability. Um, I also want to talk a little bit more about the blockade that Hassan talked about. For example, I've been trying for a whole year to get 
uh, leukemia medicine that's donated to Yemen Relief by uh, Novartis to get it to Yemen. I have not been able to get it to Yemen. That's the impact of the blockade on Yemen. Uh, and we, th we try to send water filters to Yemen. Shipment that was donated to us it took eight months to get in because of diversion. The second time we could not find a single company, shipping company in the US that agreed to take the water filters to Yemen. We had to ship to South Africa and then from South Africa, it was shipped to Yemen. It cost us four times what would have cost us if we were able to ship to Yemen. I cannot go to Yemen to visit my parents without getting the Saudi approval for me a Yemeni American, I can't visit my parents without the stamp of the Saudi that yes, I can enter into Yemen. When I go to Yemen, I'm always afraid because there is only one port, airport that's allowed under their control. I'm always afraid that they're gonna snatch me at the airport and I will disappear because they've done that to so many people. And I think the only reason they haven't done that, because I'm outspoken about their role in the war on Yemen, is because I have a US passport. So that's what we have to go through because of the blockade. Marcy, um, your question is, is very critical, actually. And then we'll go to Mark's question. Um, thank you. Two things I wanted to say. I think it's important that we hold Haynes's feet to the fire and ensure that she releases that report on the CIA investigation into the Khashoggi murder. I think that will help with political will to uh, cut off these weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. Uh, on the UAE, to what degree is their support, in your estimation, both of you, in Congress to cut off the weapon sales to the UAE? Uh, good question. <laughs> I, I agree with you on the report on Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, that, that's going to be helpful. On the UAE, let's look at what happened. Um, in the FY 2020, we got through the House resolutions to cut off weapon sales to Saudi and the UAE. Uh, in that same year, we had joint resolutions of disapproval to block weapons to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, but since what happened is the UAE signed a, a peace accord, uh, a quote unquote, you know, peace deal uh, with with Israel. And that has gained a lot of favor in D.C. Now, there's still issues. Uh, we, we ended up getting 46 senators, uh, Democratic senators to vote to block the weapon sales. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of them were making points of, well, we support the UAE, we support the peace deal, we don't support the way these weapons are being pushed through. Without this informal um, uh, process of like review that, that typically the administration, an administration would afford Congress. And so that review period didn't happen and they were just trying to ram through this 200, uh, sorry, uh, $23 billion weapons deal. So even though we got 46 Democratic senators to vote, you know, to block it, I'm not even sure that exists. Um, but doesn't mean that has to stay that way. What we have to do is really, you know, reach out to our members. I think anybody here from Arizona really needs to put the pressure on Cinema and Kelly. Um, I'm working with some activists out there to place some op-eds. I've got a lobby visit later on this week with Senator Kelly's office. We're trying to put some pressure on Senator Cinema as well. So those two two key members can kind of shift this conversation one way or the other. Are they going to, you know, kind of go more in favor of, um, you know, s supporting you know weapon sales, or are they going to, you know, kind of put this in the bucket of we have to s cut off support for the Saudi coalition, and that's part of it. One last thing I will say is that we're working on trying to flip the script instead of having joint resolutions of disapproval. So the onus is on Congress to get a, a supermajority 67 votes to be able to block any weapon to make it resolutions of approval, therefore putting the onus on the administration to at least, you know, uh, make the case so uh, enough members, even a simple majority of members can you know, authorize. So that's another fix. 
Um, I do see a couple of hands up here, but I do also have um, uh, Alan Minsky, um, the executive director of PDA. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, Alan, that'd be great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the tremendous presentation. And again, it's a tragic circumstances. I'm the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, and I see Dan O'Neill typing away, and I don't know if Dan can hear me, but Dan is our uh, state coordinator in Arizona. I suppose somewhat to our um, uh, shame at the moment. Um, there we go. He just wrote in the in the uh, chat. Um, if there's any one state in the country that is the most outstanding state within Progressive Democrats of America right now, the gold standard is Arizona. And we've got great connections across Arizona and we're available to work with you for both senders. Uh, a little bit to our shame, um, uh, Kristen Cinema was once on the advisory board of PDA Arizona. Her politics have moved, been moving very far to the right. That was back before they started moving to the right. So we actually have some personal relations with Cinema, and uh, I think less so with Kelly, um, but uh, Dan, if you want to give it a thumbs up, um, it would be really great if uh, we can help you out on that, Hassan. Absolutely. Anything that we can do here in Arizona, we will be putting as much pressure on Kelly and Cinema as possible. We're doing it anyway on about six or seven other fronts. So they're, they're on the top of our list. So we'll add this to it. So Hassan, just send me, I just put a little note, send me some talking points and whatever uh, we yeah. can do, we will do it. Okay, Dan, that's that's terrific. Um, I suggest you primary them. <laughs> well, we're we're trying to get Marcy Winograd to move from California to Arizona so we can do that. Okay, uh, I, and you asked for talking points. I dropped in an NGO letter that FCNL signed um, on this UAE weapon sale, talking about all the things that the UAE are doing. Uh, in Yemen that makes it so we shouldn't be selling weapons to them anymore about the transfers and all that. And and you can basically, you know, I, I think there's a way that they can kind of correct the record a bit here uh, by supporting the Yemen war powers, by being better in the future. So, you, you know, uh, definitely use the points in that letter and urge that they become co-sponsors of the, of the new Yemen war powers resolution that we were going to see coming up soon. Can you Hassan, can you send that to me? I'm going to put my email in the chat, okay? Yeah, I mean, I did put the letter already in the oh. chat. So oh, okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Sister Nadia, go ahead yes. with the... Um, so the next question we have um, is about um, CBC. Um, the question was uh, from Mark, and what he wanted to hear if anyone knows um, uh, or how Representative uh, Betty's uh, stance uh, on, on Yemen. One, one thing we got going for us is that every single Democrat has already voted to end support for the Yemen war. And it's primarily, you know, the makeup of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, we, we have more work to do. I, I think getting Rep Meeks to, you know, to continue to be good and to keep forcing the question. But I, I am, uh, you know, I'm not really worried uh, with the CBC on this on this issue. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but we are uh, coming closer to six and we don't want to miss out on the call to action. So I'll let uh, uh, Sister Rima and Brother Omer um, ask their questions. We will have room for two more written questions that have come up and we will go to call to action. So with Marcy's permission, that is. Uh, I will yield to the call of action because I think it's more important. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make the comment that I don't see any of the California delegation on that letter. You know, I got California in my heart. I uh, I lived there for a long time. I was born in Sacramento and lived in the Bay Area, um, but I live in D.C. now, so I guess that doesn't count. Brother Abid, um, thirty seconds or less for your question, please. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, regarding the call to action, um, uh, is, is there any way, or is it too late to put in something really quickly about ca calling for an immediate reversal of that? foreign uh, terrorist organization or to or to put in a, a immediate reversal or immediate pause if, if it's strategic to put that in if it's easier for the uh, Biden administration um, to do that and then to also just mention the point that you know the whole thing about giving waivers and licenses uh, th this is obviously needed but 
it still will prevent, you know, like you said, the banks of uh, make will make them more hesitant and and make them scale down stuff, and also it'll prevent, you know, fa remun remuner re re financial remuner whatever that word is remunerations when people uh, send money to their relatives and family, uh, we, you know, it it won't it it it'll block that and block other economic um, things. So I was just wondering, yeah. yeah. Marcy, I don't see a reason yeah. why. We can uh, we can certainly add that. Hassan, it should be a pause or a reversal that we're asking our own senators to support. So yeah, that's a good question. I think it's it's fine to add that. We were just trying to make it simple and you know just have the HJ Res 15 and HJ Res um, uh, 16 when when I wrote this this call to action. I think calling on your member to make a public statement urging Biden to reverse on day one should be uh, should be the ask. Terrific. Well, at that, I think that we should move into our capital calling party. And I want to thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Dr. Juman, for joining us tonight. It's been illuminating and motivating. And I've already tweeted to uh, Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken, my good friends, uh, to please reverse this designation on day one, hour one, and uh, release the aid. So uh, I think you both, I believe you both uh, posted, if not in the chat, Please do so how people can get in touch with you. And again, thank you so much. And now we're gonna move into our capital calling party. We have 102 people on the line or on the on this Zoom. And I urge you to stay with us. Um, let's go over the, the action alert together. And people had mentioned, can we add to it? Absolutely. I think first let's go ahead and do with what uh, do what Hassan suggested. Uh, call the capital switchboard, ask for your own Congress member's office and leave a message asking them to co-sponsor and vote in favor of HJ Res 15 and HJ Res 16 to stop, just lost my chat, honey, maybe you can, oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, there's the script. I mean, it's a long script for a phone call, but you can, you can certainly use the first paragraph. And then after that, to email this paragraph or th these few paragraphs to your Congress member. Once you do that, please call your two state senators using the Capitol Hill switchboard to uh, urge them to oppose the FTO designation so that aid can be released. How does that sound? Great. Great? Yeah. All right, let's go. Can you move that up so I can take a picture of it, please? Well, my suggestion, Marcy, would be to perhaps keep this uh, on the screen, the sure. script Screen so everyone can now. But is that the whole script that ends so a little bit higher? So if you can start, it, well, I think maybe shrink it a little bit, like make the size font smaller or the, the display. And somebody say, please, what FTO stands for? Foreign terrorist uh, organization. That's what Pompeo has termed the Houthis in Yemen which means that aid, it will be completely blocked. And it's-, uh, it's Could you move it up? We still can't see it. All I can see is the first paragraph. You know, even just those two paragraphs, that's enough. <laughs> you got it. I'm gonna oh, mute oh, myself and start calling. Uh, Marcy, could you, could you add that thing in about the uh, FTO at the bottom? I think that's something that we're gonna ask the senators to do, Hassan, if you're still with us. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it could be for anybody, uh, but you know, um, just you know, just saying that you want your member, like in addition, uh, I would like you to make a public statement calling on President Elect Biden to reverse the FTO designation on day one. What we're saying is whoever has access to this Google document is add that in there. So we don't have to remember it or think twice about it. Yeah, that, that's what that's why I was repeating it in case someone wanted to jot that down. And I'm happy to repeat that if folks need me to. Yeah, Hassan, if you repeat that, what I will do is write it down and then we can perhaps put that in a Google document as an mm -hmm. oh well actually Marcy, I see. Is that your who's editing the uh, document? <laughs> It's me. Oh, great. Okay. So Hassan, should we repeat that one more time, please? Okay. Um, uh, I urge Congressman Blank to make a public statement 
calling on President Biden to reverse the FTO designation on day one. It has to be clearer than that. It has to be the FTO designation on the Houthis. Sure. I mean, I thought that was implied because we're talking about Yemen through the whole rest of the script, but uh, well, feel free to put the Houthis on them to know. <laughs> Is it a congressperson or a senator? I thought you said senator. Your colleague would be, it, it, it applies to both. Whoever you're calling, you can just change the congressman from congressman to senator and but yeah. the reversal must be done by the president. Is that correct? Or the secretary of state or Congress, as far as I understand. Yeah, you could say, you know, calling on the Biden administration to reverse the FTO designation on the Houthis uh, day one. Uh, but I, I think it's, you know, I think that's that's pretty good here. And, you know, it's, I guess, yeah, I think this is great. So the, the, we really should call the representatives because HR 15 and 16 is a house bill, right? It's not in the Senate. Yeah, that's, that's right. So if you're calling your rep, Oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if you're calling your rep, I think this is the- I'm doing it already by now, uh, calling or emailing, I'm emailing your house rep, asking them to co-sponsor this legislation and then to publicly urge Biden and Blinken to immediately remove that FTO designation. And I guess when you go to the Senate, um, because they don't really have a chance to co-sponsor HJ Res 15, maybe just urging them to to call on Biden to reverse the FTO could work, you know, or urging that they they work to block weapon sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE without necessarily doing a number or.
Is anybody talking? I can't hear anything. We're not talking because we're calling and we're writing. And people are on mute. Sorry. Thank you for calling the United States Capitol. To be connected to your senator's office, press or say one. To be connected to your representative, press or say two. Press or say zero to continue. You have reached the United States House of Representatives. Please enter your zip code. You have entered 19103. If this is correct, press or say one. If not, Press or say one for. Please put Robert. yourself on mute. Everybody should be on mute. Thank you. Could you please repeat those digits? Thank you for calling the office of Congressman Dwight Evans. So Senator Feinstein's mailbox is full and I'm hoping that that's because we have bombarded her with uh, messages.
Honey, I don't know if you can hear me, but I can't hear the meeting anymore. Um, <laughs> that's a good thing, actually, Rima. I can hear you. I think everyone's really busy making calls. Oh, um, God. No, yeah. I can hear you. No, okay. I can. <laughs> Great. Hello? Yes. Was there a question? Yes. Okay, what is your question? 
was there a question? I think maybe at this point, um, we could just move into the chat. How are people doing? Is that, has everybody been able to make calls or at least send an email? Was there a question? Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Oh, okay. I just wanted to ask you, um, is there a way you could either post the letter on the website or else in the chat because I can't enlarge it enough. I mean, I know I can um, speak to the issue fine, but uh, if we're supposed to use the letter for some kind of template, uh, it's really small and it can't be enlarged on the screen. I've got the Zoom opened as wide as I can. So I'm just asking if that's a possibility. Mary, maybe you can move it into the chat. Yeah, she's doing that right now. <laughs> I was going to say, if, um, if you're not on our Google group, in our Google group, and you'd like to be, because I can Hi, Daryl. Hi, how are you doing? I uh, spoke to Samantha. Yes. Ruth. And Ruth. She, uh, I got uh, clarification on some information. Um, uh, the agreements are just about just... finished. But what is uh, her title? Uh, Ruth, I, I can email the script to you if you'd like. Oh, that would be wonderful. Do you want me to give you my email I, right I, now? I, I, I have it, Ruth. I'll go ahead and send it right now. Okay. Do you have? Is it the Ruth H. Strauss MD one? Marcy, you have a. Did, we do have a Google Ruth, did you get the la the last one when I I've got one that pops up whenever I put your name in? Let me just check. Um, my, I was just going to say that we have this Google group. A uh -huh. number of you are already in it, um, and I can send this letter out over the Google group as the action that we took tonight. Uh, if you are not in the Google group and you would like to be, just email me Marcy M A R C Y at codepink.org. Right now we have the Google group on moderation which means that I have to approve everything that goes out because we had a lot of traffic going back and forth. It was like, you know, not necessarily relevant to everybody. And uh, we didn't want to, we didn't want to annoy people. Uh, we want to streamline things. So uh, if you want to join, we would love to have you on board. You know, we've been doing this for about 20 minutes. I think most of us have at least made a phone call or sent an email. And I really, I want to thank all of you who stayed. How many, how many are still with us? Can you see? I can't see on my. Uh, yeah, we actually have about 33 participants, oh, really? including our right. honorable speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Joman. So. Terrific. So uh, what we'll do right now is we'll say good night. And again, I'll send this letter out over the, over the Google group uh, so that everybody can have it. Please share it with friends, get others to follow up as well. And next week, we will be discussing Iran. Yes. I'm excited Anything about else you want to say Hania or Nadia? No, I'm just, I, I'm very excited about our next uh, call and I invite everyone to please participate, at least bring a couple of people with you on these calls and get as many organizations involved. These are calls that we uh, put together to, to plan a, a call of action around. So they're impactful, they're powerful and they truly make a change. So we would love to see you all. And Sister Nadia, Maybe with her kids. Probably. It's a little bit later. Uh, all right. So at that, I, I want to thank our guests again. Dr. Juman, thank you so much for all the work that you do and for joining us tonight. And uh, thank Hassan. I want to thank Hassan. Uh, it was excellent to hear uh, his assessment of Congress and where, where we're at, what we need to do. And again, appreciate all of your participation. I hope to see you next Tuesday night. Same time, same Zoom link. Okay. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you all very much. And Bye -bye. If you want to save the chat, just click on the box at the lower end of your chat box. This phone does not take unidentified on calls. Save chat. So we'll stay a little bit for people who have a, a hard time saving it. We'll, we'll, we'll stick around for a few that minutes. That way I can enjoy Sheila's cat. Oh. <laughs> 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 Well, there's Nadia. Nadia, you want to say good night?
see her. That cat with socks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. I really, it was really great. Uh, and I really, thank you, Marcy, and thank you, Code Pink. Thank you, Hania. It's really, like, I actually feel good about this. <laughs> thank you, Nadia. I yeah. hope you'll call out with us as we go forward. Yeah. Thank you, Hania. Always terrific to work with, with my sisters. Thank you. Thank okay. you. And, and you make all of this happen, Marcy. So it's, it's really a great honor. And thank you, Mary. Yes, Mary is very a lot of work. Absolutely. Without you, none of this would be possible. All right. Good night. My pleasure. Bye, Brother Abid. Bye, bye Rima. Bye, everyone. Bye, Dr. Sonneborn.